Good morning, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started in the interest of time. Um, I'm Ruth Regan, the Hemonk Division Chief, just for anybody who doesn't know me. And it's my pleasure today to introduce Jim Cleary, one of my faculty. Jim, as you'll see when he stands up, is originally Australian. He got his uh, MD from the University of Adelaide and did all his training over there and managed to avoid doing any on this side of the Pacific, lucky him. Um, Jim is currently just promoted to professor here at the University of Wisconsin. And as he'll tell you today, he's really known for his global activities, particularly with regard to getting cancer patients throughout the world, um, opiate, opiates. Um, he's currently director of the World Health Organizing, Organi the Organization Collaborating Center for Pain Policy and Palliative Care, director for the Pain and Policy Study Group here, has numerous awards and honors throughout his lifetime, or his career rather. He has had continual funding in pain policy and palliative care for, since his uh, career here at UW. He has more than 80 publications, and he's an incredibly sought after speaker and has really spoken in all parts of the globe, we, most recently Egypt, Belarus, all over the place. So I think we'll be very interested to hear what he has to say today. Uh, thank you very much, Ruth. You mentioned Egypt. I happened to be in Egypt in May and leaving the day that the Air Egypt flight went down. Um, so there's some perils to some of this travel. But I'm going to address the uh, issues of the other opioid crisis. On a daily basis, we are actually confronted, blasted by the media, lay media, and also by the medical media about the prescription painkiller overdose situation that exists in the United States. We see an increase in opioid consumption, opioid-related uh, events, and this is documented for us on a regular basis, on a state-by-state -state basis. Paralleling this at the moment is an increase in heroin overdoses, being reported again on a regular basis, and most recently an influx of fentanyl and carfentanyl. For those of you who don't use carfentanil, I suspect few of you in the room, it's the painkiller for elephants. So we are confronted with these crises. Much of the crisis that we're confronted is attributed to physician prescribing of opioids, and we see opioid sales, opioid deaths, and uh, opioid treatment admissions going up. But at the same time, the Institute of Medicine tells us that 100 million people in the United States suffer with chronic pain. And even if a small percentage of those people need pain relief with opioids, the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse says that even if a small percentage of the group that uses opioids develops sub uh, substance abuse disorders, a large number of people can be affected. This is not just a problem of the United States. Canada has significant problems. The health minister is addressing this there. But effectively, the high-income countries, which make up 16% of the world's population, are consuming 90% of the world's morphine. We can show this in a number of ways, and this is data that we obtain from the International Narcotic Board, looking at morphine consumption per person. We have published on a parameter called morphine equivalents per cancer and HIV death, showing that it's largely the high-income countries that actually use a considerable amount of opioids. Or here's another way of showing it um, geographically, and this is from the Global Access to Pain and Relief Initiative from the Union for International Cancer Control. Most of the world unrecognisable because of their low access availability of opioids. But let's make this real with a patient story. Here, in the rural outskirts of Calcutta, India, top-notch medical care is hard to come by. But Dr. Abhijit Dam makes do. The day we met him, he had transformed this school courtyard into a makeshift clinic and a virtual pharmacy, dispensing drugs for a variety of ailments. But when he heard reports of a woman dying of breast cancer in a neighboring village, Dr. Dam knew he was in for a challenge. The woman, named Fatima, had a massive breast tumor, clearly infected and clearly painful. 
she has severe pain. She can't sleep at night. Fatima's family says she screams in agony day and night. But because of strict narcotics laws, morphine, the gold standard in pain treatment, is nearly impossible to get in most of India. So Dr. Dam is forced to improvise with readily available analgesics. This is really difficult to watch. And it's particularly difficult um, considering that, you know, with a two rupee medication, she would not be screaming. So as much as I will be considering the global management of pain um, and the access to opioids, really there are a number of other opioid crises that we could be considering as we move forward. So my objectives today are to try and understand some of the issues around the US opioid crisis, look at the lack of access globally to opioids, understand the principle of balance, and hopefully you will leave here practicing a little more wisely. And I use the word wisely because a few years ago I was actually asked to talk on the topic of wisdom in Thailand. And Thailand is the home of wisdom, so I actually had to find out what wisdom was. And this is a definition I like. Wisdom resists automatically the thinking, understands ambiguity better, grasps a deeper meaning of what is known, and understands the limits of knowledge. But in doing this and considering, I'd like to actually address some historical context of how we've got to where we are today. The first hospice as we know it was established in 1842 in Lyon, France. It spread to Paris in 1875 and to Calvary Hospice in New York in 1899. This is not a mistake. 1899. Hospice has been with us now in the United States for over 117 years. Throughout this period, we saw the isolation of morphine, which became popular in its use during the Civil War with the advent of the hypodermic needle. Heroin was, introduced, or was synthesized in 1874, its diacetyl morphine, and was introduced into the country in 1898 by Bayer Pharmaceuticals, the maker of aspirin. It was a cough suppressant, which was less addictive than morphine, according to the experts. At the same time, the opium wars were taking place in China, and basically this corrected the trade deficit between India and China. Too much tea was coming to India, so the, Indian, the British decided to send opium to China. And they ended up, the Europeans ended up winning those wars in inverted commas. But in 1909, the first International Opioid Commission took place in Shanghai. It wasn't enacted until 1919 after World War I, and even at that stage, the US and China were pulling out of the convention, becoming more prohibitionist. And the prohibition was the Harrison Act in 1915, Dangerous Drug Act of 1920, and by World War II, some 25,000 physicians had been put up on narcotic charges, 3,000 in jail. World War II saw the regular use of morphine, most soldiers carried a uh, supply on them, a serrette. Interestingly, the soldiers didn't have the needle, so it couldn't be abused. And to make sure there wasn't overdosing, the serrettes were actually clipped to the lapels of the shoulder, uh, soldiers after it was administered. So safety was being introduced there. The Germans actually introduced a number of opioids between the wars, and these were used during World War II, including methadone. But after World War II, Dame Cecily Saunders at St. Um, sorry, at St. Joseph's Hospice in London actually documented that the regular administration of morphine every four hours resulted in improved quality of life for the cancer patients who were there. 1960 saw the development of fentanyl, the synthesis, the first of the real synthetic medications. And 1960 is important because it was during that year that the UN got together and established the Single Convention of Narcotic Drugs, which was signed in 1961. This establishes a framework to prevent abuse and diversion and ensure the availability of drugs for medical purposes. It's not an or, this is an and, it's dual purpose. The, the Single Convention says the medical use of narcotic drugs continues to be indispensable for the relief of pain and suffering. In 1977, the WHO established its first essential medicines list, and we can see that codeine and morphine were included in that list. 
No, there weren't sustained release tablets in 1977, but these have since been added. Because of the work of Cecily Saunders, a number of palliative care physicians in both Canada and the United Kingdom began to do different research. Both Baumout and Robert Twycross investigated and compared morphine versus Brompton cocktail. The standard therapy at that time for the treatment of cancer pain was largely a recipe developed in 1893. And even in my life, I've actually prescribed Brompton cocktail back home in Australia. I don't think it had the cocaine or cannabis in it when I was prescribing it. <laughs> but I didn't inhale. Um, Robert Twycross did some interesting work with the use of heroin um, in the United Kingdom. And even to this date, the most common opioid used at the end of life for, in palliative care in the United Kingdom is heroin diacetylmorphine. We see little, very little evidence of diversion. Heroin was actually the reason that the Wisconsin Cancer Pain Initiative started here in the 80s. During the 1970s, the Controlled Substances Board was actually asked to look at whether heroin would be useful for pain control based on the work being done in the United uh, Kingdom. David Johnson and June Dahl established the Wisconsin Cancer Pain Initiative with the support of the US Assistant Surgeon General and the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Things were changing globally and we see the World Health Organization in 1986 establish its ladder, going from non-opioids, opioids to mild to moderate pain, and then opioids for moderate to severe pain. And this year is significant, and you will see in the literature uh, in common reports these days, stories of this report, Russell Portner and Kathy Foley at Memorial Sloan Kettering, reporting 38 cases of non-malignant pain where they used opioids. This is supposedly the document that was then used to actually uh, account for the fact that approximately 90% of the opioids in the United States now are prescribed for non-cancer pain. 1988, the Wisconsin Cancer Pain Initiative did a study with the Controlled Substances Board here in Wisconsin, which actually showed that you could use morphine for cancer pain with no increase in diversion or crime. Charlie Cleland led some research together with Jim Stewart as our principal investigator here, which looked at pain in cancer centres. Basically, if you were in a major US cancer centre in the 90s, and it's still true today, some 40% are undertreated, and at least 40% are undertreated, and you're more likely to be undertreated if you're an older minority female. The Pain and Policy Studies Group, which I now direct, uh, has been a collaborating centre with that since that time and has close ties with the International Narcotic Control Board. And the data you're seeing at the bottom of these graphs is actually the opioid consumption data. I've highlighted the United States in blue, um, Australia in gold and Germany in green. And this bump in the United States and Australia was due to pharmaceutical companies actually releasing but in the United States MS Cotton and Cadian in Australia. In 2000, the WHO hosted a workshop here, Achieving Balance in National Opioids Control Policy, and this became the standard for how we introduce opioids around the world into different countries. Balance. National policy should establish a drug control system that prevents diversion and ensures adequate availability for medical use. Critically, drug control measures should not interfere with medical access to opioids. Initially supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation project, Improving Care at the End of the Life, which funded the, um, the support study of which Marshfield was involved in, we began reporting state policies and comparing these. And this is the latest report saying that many countries, sorry, many states have actually, uh, some of them may be countries soon. Um, <laughs> but many states have actually um, improved their policies. But let's look at some of the examples that have existed. Here's the Mississippi Medical Board policy statement. Controlled substances are only used after all other measures and non-controlled analgesics are found to be ineffective. And there was no differentiation here with cancer and non-cancer patients. So these policies applied to cancer patients. Whereas Iowa, the board strives to ensure that all Iowans have access to pain relief medications. Georgia, where Dr. O'Regan practiced for a while. Certain conditions, drug holidays are appropriate. 
It allows you to see whether the original symptoms recur when the drug is not given, indicating a continued legitimate use, or whether withdrawal symptoms occur, indicating drug dependence. I'm not sure I would want to be a cancer patient in Georgia if that's something that they're recommending. But these policies are often attributed for the dramatic increase in opioid consumption in the United States. And you can now see when we take the sum of five opioids, morphine, hydromorphone, oxycodone, fentanyl and uh, Demerol, the US now consumes approximately 600 milligrams of morphine equivalents per year per person. And most of you in the room are probably saying, hey, I didn't get my 600 last year, but it's there if we need it. So this is the dilemma that we actually face in the United States now. These opioid deaths going up and relieving pain, how do we actually engage with opioids um, in this situation in terms of pain relief? But I want you to focus on the graph on the left. And in actual fact, if I change that graph, and use the opioid-related deaths per 10,000 people rather than per 100,000 people, it changes the curve dramatically. The CDC puts out the curve on the, uh, on the left, and you can say they're not lying. They've actually put up 100,000, but most of us don't read it when we actually see it. We have seen a much stronger correlation. And if you look at the bottom curve, it actually shows that the opioid deaths per kilogram of opioids used has not actually changed since the 1990s. We may as a society have to accept that there is a risk in using opioids. Let me be very, very strong and clarify, and to quote Tom Hanks, Houston, we have a problem. It wasn't Tom Hanks, but anyway. We do have a problem in the United States and we need to address it. We need to restore balance. But to do this, we actually have to understand what the problem is. And this is one of my favourite quotes, fibs, lies and statistics. And let's look at some of the statistics that are actually being used. But first let's go to the illegal. It turns out that in California approximately or 71 physicians, less than or a tenth of a percent of uh, the physicians in California were responsible for 300 or 17 percent of the deaths associated with opioids. And these were physicians who were running pill mills. Here is another example from uh, Arkansas. I'm not trying to be racist by defining this physician as Indian American, but this it was actually picked up in an Indian newspaper. This physician was charged, but was actually writing 400 controlled substance scripts, prescriptions per day. 400. It makes my five every Tuesday look quite insignificant in terms, and I'm practicing in a palliative care clinic. So this is the significant story that we need to look at. Hydrocodone has been a significant issue, and you'll often hear the statistic that the US consumes almost 100% of the world's hydrocodone. We are the only country to consume hydrocodone, so it's a useless statistic. And I've told Sanjay Gupta that, but he continues to say it. The other statistic is that 70% of Americans misuse and abuse opioids, narcotics. That's significant, but what does misuse mean? The National Institute of Drug Abuse defines misuse in any way that a doctor did not direct you to use them. So use in greater amounts, more often, or longer than the respondent told you to take them is misuse. I am guilty. I have misused opioids. I've had it with alcohol when I've been told not to have it with alcohol, post-operatively, not recreationally. <laughs> so if we look at the number, and this is the percentage of people from surveys by NIDA, showing that in actual facts over the last decade, the number of people misusing opioids in the last month has not gone up. And the percentage of people on these surveys who are actually misusing in the last year has actually come down, reaching a peak of 5.8 down to 4.9. And who is most likely to misuse? People who are using other drugs. And we see here heroin, 72%, uh, methamphetamine, 42%. And what happens when we misuse? These are interesting statistics from the same surveys. 
So the, the left-hand figure, figure one, the percentage of year before last initiates not using the substance in the past by in the next year. So about 56% of people who started using pain relievers end up not using them. And the other statistic is that if you, how many people become dependent, and on these statistics it's approximately 3% of folks. Now that's a significant number in the US when we actually consider those, and that's an important issue. But where do people get these prescriptions? 34% get them from one doctor, and 40% get them from a friend or relative. They're not buying them, they're being given. And when I had wisdom teeth removed, I actually didn't fill the 30 oxycodone uh, tablets that I was given, but used some of the 10 in the cupboard that were there from my daughter's wisdom teeth removal. So that's misuse, and I would fall into that category, although I didn't ask my daughter, she'd already left home and they were still just sitting there. But most people who misuse do so for pain relief. And this is a significant factor if we look at it. But let's get some Wisconsin data, and I think this is significant if we look at the non-medical users there recently. But from 2007 to 2014, almost 60% of uh, 12th graders um, who use narcotics um, other than heroin were given them for pain from a, sorry, were given for free from a friend or a relative. But that's significant, but it may have actually been for pain control that they were given them. Even mums saying, hey, use one of my Vicodin for your severe headache. I'm not saying this is right. I think it's actually the norm of what we're seeing. We now have prescription monitoring programs in the United States, which are very, very important as we move forward. But the right-hand graphs actually show now what is happening to deaths in, the United, in Wisconsin. And we can see, and I, what I would like to talk about to start with, is the methadone deaths, which are in the grey in this curve. So what is happening when we actually look at this data, and hidden up here in this um, CDC webpage, one in third of the opioid associated deaths were actually due to methadone. This is a rather surprising finding, but we can look at it by a number of states, and we can see the percentages particularly high on the west coast and up in the northeast. Methadone was a significant attributor to the prescription painkillers dispensed in each state, and if we look at Washington state, it was a small percentage of uh, prescriptions in that state but it actually contributed in 2006 to over 50% of the opioid-associated deaths. Some researchers or reporters from the uh, Seattle Times actually did this, and the reason behind this problem was the fact that the uh, uh, assembly, the politicians in Washington, had actually said that patients after morphine, Medicaid patients, will be given methadone. So this was a legislatively mandated prescribing of methadone, in many cases by physicians who actually have no idea how to use the medication. So methadone is a tough medicine to use, but we've seen some stabilisation in the deaths associated with uh, methadone in terms of overdoses and the, uh, the deaths. But heroin has been the other significant issue that we're seeing now creeping into the uh, the, uh, the US and continuing around the world. And we can see that heroin deaths are now going up. What is even more striking at the moment is statistics from the National Institute of Drug Abuse suggesting that the re in reality there is no statistical increase in the number of uh, new heroin users in the last year. This may surprise you greatly. There is a statistical uh, point here in 2006, there's been a, but overall they're saying there hasn't been an increase in new heroin users. So what's happening? There's a recent paper from this year looking at the relationship between non-medical prescription opioid use and heroin abuse. And many people, and you'll hear the story, it's the, uh, the new deterrent abuse opioids that are now causing people to actually switch to heroin. This is in this study, they've looked at the rise in heroin consumption and their actual uh, heroin deaths and use during this period, and it started going up even before the abuse deterrent or even any of the restrictions came in. 
the biggest predictor of opioid, of heroin consumption in this country is price. And black tar heroin has had a huge influx from Mexico, very, very cheap, and is readily available. This study is significant because they've actually isolated who then goes on to use heroin. And it's been in the last number of years not just people who were using prescription monitoring programs. People who were using other psychotherapeutic agents had a 100% increase in their use of heroin over this time. So can we truly attribute this whole heroin situation that we have in the country to the prescription opioid crisis as we continue to hear even from politicians at different times? This is the Wisconsin data showing the... Uh, the heroin uh, situation in between people from the age of 18 to 34 in the more bold and the uh, 35 years and older. And we can see that heroin usage is actually jumping up considerably and this is related to the ER visits and um, from both heroin prescription opioids that they're monitoring. A recent very significant data from, data from Massachusetts um, has come out from the Department of Public Health where they've actually combined eight databases and really shown some significant findings. If we look at the opioid-associated deaths in, the, uh, in Massachusetts, two-thirds were from heroin. A half included benzodiazepines as well. And 60% of the opioid-associated deaths are polypharmacy, alcohol and benzodiazepines. The benzos may actually be more toxic than even the opioids but we so commonly prescribe benzodiazepines. Fentanyl and cocaine, roughly a third each. The CDC doesn't even have a way of measuring non-medical fentanyl overdoses, so they've now stopped reporting the data as we see the influx of illegal fentanyl into the country. But significantly, of those who had a Schedule II or three opioid in their um, toxicology, only nine of them had a legitimate prescription. So the problem and why we may be with prescribing, feeding the problem, there is no causality um, attributed in this report to the actual uh, opioid prescribing situation and the current heroin overdose. Here we see um, an increase in the orange in the synthetic opioids, fentanyl and carfentanyl. Carfentanyl, as I mentioned, is the pain relief medicine for elephants, the anaesthetic agent. And we actually, it's 10,000 times more potent than morphine. Vets use glasses to protect getting eye droplets of carfentanil. And I think it's quite significant. You can import a kilogram of carfentanil for just over $2,500 from China. And if you actually look at that, and it's now the carfentanil, Cincinnati had 36 deaths, um, overdoses in one day related to carfentanil was actually deaths, 126 in a weekend because this is now being put into the heroin that people are using. So we have a problem, and I think we need to be addressing this significantly as we move forward. But as we look at this, the other crisis that I think we have in this country is that we're not truly addressing pain. And we need to find much better ways, and I think the VA is a leading in this initiative, in really addressing how we pr uh, provide uh, multidisciplinary pain medicines. And this is a policy brief, never only opioids. And this is a real deficit and I think a crisis that we have in this country. We cannot forget the treatment of pain. I'm going to try not to be too political, but this is a letter from the Attorney General of Florida, Pam Bondi, who is better known for her contributions to the uh, um, Trump campaign related to Trump University. But she actually wrote, and I think it's significant, she's writing to the DEA, our collective efforts have succeeded in Florida beyond comprehension. In four years, we've shut down 500 pill mills, reduced the footprint from 98 of the top 100 hydrocodone prescribers nationally to zero, and saved hundreds of lives thanks to dramatic declines in prescription drug overdose deaths. Oxycodone deaths declined 65% and prescription drug deaths declined 30% overall. And what did they do? They stopped physicians being allowed to dispense opioids in Florida. Simple change in policy. The previous governor, Jeb Bush, had actually declined to do this, but that has been changed four years ago and there's been a dramatic change. But now we're actually seeing, because of activities of the DEA, 
Even hospice patients don't have access to opioids. Pharmacists are being told you can only dispense to 20 patients and you choose the 20 you're going to use. You need to bring pain patients down to a level that is actually acceptable. And what's now acceptable? The CDC has put out guidelines which have defined what is acceptable. This, these were very controversial at the beginning of this year. Congress told them to go back and actually do the process properly. Um, and they have released these. And they're saying that basically people shouldn't be on more than 100 milligrams of morphine a day. They're for primary care practitioners. And these are now being implemented into policies by state licensing boards, by um, uh, insurance plans. And recently a Californian physician, sorry, pharmacist wrote to the, uh, the head of um, uh, the guidelines at the CDC and said, I am no longer getting the stable dose of morphine at approximately 200 milligrams a day because of your guidelines. And here is her response. The guideline is a set of voluntary recommendations intended to guide primary care physicians as they work with their patients. The guideline includes a recommendation to taper or reduce dosage only when patient harm outweighs patient benefit of opioid therapy. The guideline is not a rule, regulation or law. It is not intended to deny access to opioid pain medicines as an option for pain management. It is not intended to take away physician discretion and decision making. The CDC encourages physicians to continue to use their clinical judgment and base their treatment on what they know about their patients. It is the ultimate goal of the guidelines to ensure people who need them have access to opioids while reducing opioid-related deaths. And those of you who have a license probably got a letter recently from the United States Surgeon General which would give a different message saying stop using opioids and please pledge to stop using opioids and stop this crisis. But this is not just a problem here, and this is where I turn to the global crisis. The Indian Medical Association has actually accepted the CDC guidelines. It's lock, stock and barrel. And let's turn to India. Human Rights Watch has actually written on this. The Times of India has published. And while we can actually see in the United States that we may actually consume 75, 76 milligrams of morphine. India consumes less than 0.1 milligram of morphine per person per year. They have none. And in actual fact, we can see they used to consume some, but they actually introduced in some significant laws in 1990, which would actually jail a physician for three years if the morphine count is incorrect. Um, so physicians don't tend to go there. We have been working in India for many years, trying to improve these. Um, and they were, India is part of a number of countries where we've worked. So as Pain and Policy Studies Group uh, started on this international work, in Germany you could only get one day of outpatient morphine. If you're a cancer patient at home, that's not very effective. Italy, eight days. Um, Uganda, none. And we can see that with changes in policy and the work that we've done, and this has been documented in the medical literature, Uganda now has morphine available and registered nurses are allowed to prescribe the morphine, specially trained registered nurses. And we can see what's happened to the opioid consumption of, uh, in Uganda, that it has increased. There are some years when they haven't reported, but in actual fact it's not high but there has been a significant increase in opioid morphine consumption. We also worked in Romania and particularly established um, a clinical champion and we brought a group of uh, collaborators, policy people, uh, pharmacologists and palliative care physicians here to Madison, put them in a windowless room and we rewrote the opioid prescribing laws for Romania um, in 2005, resulting in a significant improvement in pain relief and palliative care. But Eastern Europe has had significant problems. And we can see here that while the consumption of morphine increased in the uh, Western Europe, in Eastern Europe it didn't increase at all. Colleagues from the European Association of Palliative Care and the European Society of Medical Oncology did a study. Not a difficult slide to understand. Across the top you have medicines. Down the uh, 
the y-axis, you actually have uh, countries. The colour represents the cost. So we can see Western Europe has access to medicines and largely at not much cost to patients. This is the situation, was the situation, continues to be in much of Eastern Europe, where we can see that many countries don't have opioids. Even some countries don't have immediate release opioids, morphine, and one country only has injectable morphine. And here's a demonstration of that problem. People in more than half the countries around the globe have limited access to medical morphine, and of that number, more than half face severe shortages of pain medication. Here in Ukraine, some of the same bureaucratic hurdles that plague India mean that even a former decorated KGB colonel is left to die in pain. Artur Shumanov has stage 4 prostate cancer and is living out the end of his life alone and suffering. It got so bad, he says, he's left his family in Kiev and moved to this cottage in a remote village hours from the capital. The under-treatment of pain is a huge, huge issue. In Ukraine, pain is part of life. Mm -hmm. and we can see the mark where the radiotherapy was given. We invited Dr. James Cleary, a leading authority on global palliative care, to join us of the scope of the problem here. Because of his pain, he's cut himself off from his family. What greater time is there for a man to need his family than when he's facing advanced disease? But what did he say? He didn't want them to see him cry. Artur has found his own way to numb his agony. And if it gets bad enough, Artur showed us his other plan to stop the pain. To watch Arturo reach under his pillow as he's talking about potentially ending his own life and then just pulling out this gun. It is not a gun in a cupboard. This is a gun that he sleeps on. So clearly the, severe, the impact of this severe pain is great if he's that close most of the time. That was a trip I did with a group of journalism students from the University of British Columbia. And in actual fact, Artur was showing us a, an award he received from Gorbachev, and that was what was in the other hand. The photographer tried to, cameraman tried to get him to repeat because he wasn't quite sure that he'd caught the, uh, the production of the gun, and the, Artur refused to. This was not a uh, set-up situation. This is something he did spontaneously. He died some three months later after the, um, uh, we, our visit, and he did not die from gunshot wounds. He died from progression of his cancer with someone else providing morphine for him that they'd actually obtained illegally from other patients whose need had actually decreased. A Robin Hood situation. But there are multiple barriers that exist in terms of access to opioids, not only in this country. Concerns about addiction, although that's going down. We see insufficient training of professionals, law, cost, absence of policy. So we did, through an initiative called the Global Opioid Policy Initiative, actually address opioid barriers in different regions, Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, and uh, Middle East, and also India as a separate uh, region. And what we really established as we went forward was that there are very significant barriers, and the countries in red and pink actually have four to six uh, to eight significant barriers restricting access to opioids. We did not survey United States, Canada or Australia or New Zealand. The other countries in white did not provide their results. But the World Health Organization is addressing this problem in a resolution in 2014. Strengthening of palliative care is a component of integrated treatment within the continuum of care. 
And importantly in this resolution, they actually talk about the access to medicines as being absolutely critical. The United Nations has taken this up and just this year there was a special session of the United Nations on drugs where they actually addressed drugs in general but somewhat reluctantly agreed to take up the issue of opioid availability. In preparation for that meeting, the International Narcotic Control Board published their latest report looking at the trends in opioid consumption by region. And you can see here that North America, this is a term called defined daily doses, very high, Western and Central Europe high, Oceania. But if we look at these other regions, the I and the INCB says anything less than 200 is low and less than 100 is very low. So we can see that much of the world's population fits into this criteria of being low or in fact very low. And this is shown graphically with purple being less excess and we can see the countries, how little they have. This is a graph showing three time periods for countries of the Asian continent, extending from the Middle East out into the, uh, the Philippines, and we can see that most of the countries in Asia still fit into the very low category at less than 100 defined daily doses per million inhabitants. The International Narcotic Board had their first publication in The Lancet um, looking at these and getting this out for general dissemination. Um, my colleagues Azra Hussein and Martha Maurer and I were delighted and proud to have a commentary accompanying this uh, leading article. And probably the thing that excited me most was actually having a quote from Thomas the Tank Engine in The Lancet. But importantly, the quote is, you are lucky, Gordon, to have a controller who knows how to run railways. The International Narcotic Control Board is not there to restrict access to opioids. It is to make sure the system works well. If you have too much opioids, um, you run the risk of actually having too much uh, diversion. Um, so there, there is not to restrict, and they're increasingly taking this policy and looking more at the issues of balance as we move forward. But the public health model that we need, and we, I used to have this triangle with the base at the bottom, but it really represents balancing a triangle is tough. We need to ensure medicine availability, we need to have policies, laws and regulations, and we need education. The Pain and Policy Studies Group has actually had an International Pain Policy Fellowship which started in 2006 where we've worked with different people and I haven't got the countries here, Nigeria, um, Serbia, Panama, Vietnam, Uganda, Argentina, Colombia and Sierra Leone. And I think I'm doing pretty well with my flags at this stage. But this is the example from uh, uh, Vietnam and colleagues visiting there but working with them, identifying the barriers, we've actually seen a significant rise in opioid consumption in Vietnam, primarily used for cancer patients there. And we can see that this is not just for morphine. If we look at the data um, from the uh, fentanyl now increasing as well as morphine, we tend not to like to see an increase in pethidine, but they're still using, or Demerol, they're still using uh, pethidine in uh, uh, Vietnam. Our second cohort included a number of collaborators and I've identified the countries here. Nepal, the only country without a rectangular flag. Uh, trivia for you for a quiz night. Um, but we can see because of issues of barriers in terms of access of these uh, opioids, importing them from India, they started their own manufacturing there and we have a rise in opioid consumption. Still small but significant. Jamaica has had a significant increase and some of the issues that they identified were not only policies but some regulations. Rural pharmacies were not allowed to accept or receive delivery of morphine on the regular um, pharmaceutical delivery truck. Pharmacists had to go and pick up the opioids personally from Kingston from the warehouse. So they had to close their shop. So on the day that regulation changed, 200 physicians said, we will now stop morphine if we need to. Kenya has had a significant increase. They've reduced a tax on morphine that the government applied. I show this because they don't always report the data as they should. 
And we can see now, and our colleague Dr Zibiali actually went down to the Dangerous Drugs Board and said, give me the data, and we can see that they've had a significant rise in opioid consumption. More recently, we've had colleagues from Southeast Asia and also the East former Soviet Union. And this brings us back to the Indian situation. They passed and we rewrote the Indian uh, Dangerous Drugs Act here in uh, 2012, just as the Edgewater was being knocked down. It was the last thing we did there before it was uh, knocked down. And in 2014, this was passed by the Parliament, but the um, regulations are still going through the system. We've also recently worked with colleagues in Africa, um, and it really is and this continues to astound me how big the African continent is, but working in Sudan, Rwanda. Rwanda, we're now working and looking at if we can integrate electronic medical records and a prescription monitoring program there. The Sudan, a simple step of having the cancer center pharmacy stock morphine. Previously, patients had to walk a kilometer from the cancer centre to the main hospital pharmacy to get their morphine, which wasn't happening. So we have major barriers. There are things that we can learn, and I think the group that we can learn most from is the Office of National Drug Control Policy here in the United States. And this is led now by Michael Botticelli from Massachusetts, himself a, a man dealing with issues of uh, alcohol um, in long term, and he talks very strongly about his own recovery. But importantly, what he talks about is the need for education. Education, education. And it's not just education of healthcare practitioners, it's an education of society. So many of our youth and other, even their parents, feel that these medicines are actually harmless. Uh, we need continual research and development on this. We do need prescription monitoring programs, and now 49 of the 50 states have prescription monitoring programs. But we meet, need to make these real-time. We need to have them integrated into the electronic medical record so that when I actually prescribe an opioid, this data is actually fed to me rather than having to go and look in another database. We need proper medication disposal. And as I've illustrated, we keep opioids in the cupboard. Um, why? Just for that rainy day. Um, but we need to make sure we get rid of them properly. We need these take-back programs that are significant. And again, the fourth component is enforcement. And what he talks about here is getting rid of the pill mills, the doctor shopping, the ability of physicians to dispense these, or indeed in many states it's a collaboration between physicians and pharmacists breaking the law and having these opioids come through. But this is really the situation we face as we move forward. We need medicine availability. We need education of clinicians, patients and the communities, changes in laws and policies. And I'll finish with this statement from the FDA Commissioner. The real root causes of the problem, which are excessive prescribing of opioid pay medications, improper disposal of drugs and inadequate physician education, Addressing the opioid crisis by focusing on a single drug opioid supply will simply not be effective. This complex public health challenge of opioid abuse requires a comprehensive and science-based approach involving federal, state governments, public health experts, opioid prescribers. Then and only then will we truly solve this problem and protect the public health. And I would add to that the global health, because what is happening here in this country is having a dramatic impact on access to pain relief for patients such as Fatima and Artur. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you, Jim, for that great talk. Do we have any questions for Jim? So the question is, or the, the statement was that in states that have decriminalised, have medical marijuana, that we've seen the use of opioids go down. Um, what is the role of cannabis in this? I think the role of cannabis is one that we need to research. The Israelis are actually doing a much better job in terms of using this. There are some products that are being researched. Archimedes is a company that's doing that. They've not shown any benefit of the cannabinoid products for cancer pain 
It may actually be the, the, the product they've isolated and delivering. I think we need far more research on it. It is a natural product, just like morphine is. Um, the concern I have with that data that we see, is it just because opioids in that population are used by people to feel good and cannabis does that? So differentiating this, uh, is it cancer, is it pain, is it actually just feeling good, or is it I don't care? That's another issue that we, we need to analyse it properly. But I don't think we should shut the door on exploring the role of cannabis in pain management, which is tough in this country because of the scheduling issues related to, uh, to cannabis. Yeah. Um, so the question is, is there any financial incentives to keep this going? In the US, we would call that the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and in actual fact, there's a very interesting contrast. Um, Suboxone is effect almost a $2 billion a year product, which is used in now in the treatment of opioid dependency. Oxycontin is $2.5 billion, $3 billion a year. So there's clearly a clear incentive. One of the problems with the abuse deterrent products is that it keeps the patent going by having a new formulation. So the companies who've moved in now to abuse deterrent um, opioids have a new lease of, lease of patency and protection in the market. So there's all sorts of things caught up in the US situation. I would say there's financial disincentives to use opioids. Insurance companies don't pay for appropriate pain management. It's actually very hard for people to get appropriate physical therapy, psychological support. The VA, and I'll come back as the VA has moved forward and addressed this issue, the veterans have actually been affected um, dramatically by some of these opioid-associated deaths, and they have now moved very critically into addressing, in many cases, full coverage um, of full-spectrum multidisciplinary pain management. So, Jay, I mean, uh, can you comment? I know you, the work you did in Uganda was pretty amazing. So how, how do they get opioids there now in terms of, you know, formulations? And so how do they get opioids in Uganda at the present time? So interestingly, and people say, well, we manufacture the morphine. You actually, they buy the powder. It comes in from Scotland. Many people don't know that the most common source of medical poppies at the moment is Tasmania, um, where they're actually growing Thebane. And why do they grow Thebane? Because it only takes one chemical reaction to make oxycodone, so it's saving money. Um, but Uganda buys the powder from Scotland, I think, at the present time, and they're actually, the hospice started making their own mixture there. So they had oral morphine, which was made and distributed. It's coloured. Uh, they've now actually, they still the primary source is the oral solution. Because the hospice is now selling it to the government, and it's being distributed throughout the hospitals, they've had to, really had to go up in their manufacturing process, making sure the water's distilled, the bottles are sterile, all this sort of stuff. So the cost has actually risen in Uganda. And the cost of these is significant. There is largely no profit margin in morphine. And we see, and if you look at some of the examples I showed, we see an influx in fentanyl, and this is largely because pharmaceutical companies are going in and promoting fentanyl. Turkey is one of the largest growers of uh, uh, morphine in the world. Um, they're a traditional grower along with India. Um, but they actually consume almost zero morphine. They're consuming fentanyl largely as the fentanyl patch. So th there are, it comes back to your uh, financial incentive issue. There are very, very strong financial incentives. I remember when we were in Romania, and it was quite dramatic, they had a workshop on educating physicians, and they brought in 500 physicians. And even though fentanyl was not actually approved in the country yet, Janssen took 500 uh, clinicians up to Dracula's castle for a party. And this is where we see that whole combination of the pharmaceutical countries. I did declare my conflict from 2005 to 2010. Our centre actually did receive, or the university received on behalf of our centre, some unrestricted grants. But this whole interaction of industry, not just in this topic, but cancer drugs, all medications, really needs to be considered very, very carefully as we move forward. And we need to think about applying these same regulations and restrictions in low-income countries. Back.
And if I can just ask before I answer, which country are you from? Syria. Syria. So Syria's got other problems at the moment, if I can point that out. And a few years ago, I was actually asked to do a, uh, a cancer control review in, for the WHO in Syria, and they actually ended up having the meeting in Cyprus rather than going into Syria. So, uh, you know, it's a very tough situation. Infrastructure is a critical issue. And this is the question, do the countries have the resources to actually study, uh, know what's going on? It was interesting when we sat down in Zambia. Zambia, a relatively poor country. Um, we sat down with the competent authority um, in, in Tebe, Uganda, at a workshop, and he actually opened his computer and had a spreadsheet telling us exactly where every opioid went to a hospital or pharmacy in the whole country. And you sit there saying, this is wonderful data, and we're actually trying to get that published, and if anyone wants to uh, work on a project, it would be, you know, we've got this data, and we can geocode it. So it's interesting, you don't need a lot of resources when you're not distributing. Sudan now distributes to five hospitals in the country. We don't need a lot of data to know where it's actually going. There are people on the Lancet Global Commission for Palliative Care and Pain Control who are saying, well, maybe we could use technology and put uh, RIF sensing on the blister packs so that we know when everyone actually takes a tablet. Now, I don't want to know to that detail what's going on. It would be able to, mo to monitor where the blister packs are is, I think, something that we may be able to actually do. So when they're dispensed, can we introduce some of this technology? The use of cell phones and mobile technology is something that's really being explored. In Tanzania, for HIV drugs, they have a whole supply chain issue where they're keeping track of HIV medications in Tanzania using mobile technology. Why can't we do that with opioids? It's not rocket science. We really just have the will, and now we see the UN, the International Narcotic Control Board, and WHO actually saying this is a focus. They've approached the US government for funding, and every time they ask for funding, it seems that they get rejected, largely because we cannot be seen to be promoting opioids given the current situation in this country. Sir. Well, new opioid users are new, op a new heroin users are new. You can't be another new heroin user. So the question is what would actually, I'll, I'll, two questions, and I'll focus on ketamine is an interesting issue. What's the role of ketamine in this? There's actually been studies done in Australia in the palliative care population which actually suggest that ketamine is actually not that useful. It was a double-blind study led by David Currow. People have questioned the dose, the way of delivery, um, but we're not seeing it. It works wonderfully for depression. And as we look at actually the overall uh, symptoms of suffering that people have at the end of life, so depression may be a contributing factor to that. There are anecdotal reports of the role of ketamine, but the randomized controlled trial... Tr it's trial nine hours. Um, that's to tell us to stop. In terms of decriminalization, the best example we actually have of that is Portugal, which has actually now sort of decriminalized it. New Zealand has said the same thing. So all these new synthetic drugs that are being synthesized, they just come through, and the New Zealand government has effectively said... Hey, guys, if you're going to play with these medicines, these new things, accept the risks. We're not going to stop you now and have this whole restrictive thing going on. So that's a policy and a public health issue that we really need to address very significantly if we're going to look at the decriminalisation. We know that prohibition didn't work for alcohol. 
And many people say we ought to learn our lessons from that as we move forward to ensure that the world has access to these essential medicines. I'll stop there, Ruth. And again, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jim.